how radio works. Everyone is fairly familiar with the idea of sound waves radiating from a source, rather like the spread of ripples on the surface of a still pond after a stone is dropped into it. Like ripples on water, however, sound waves are only able to travel for relatively short distances since the energy associated with the passage of the sound wave through the air is damped, or dissipated, by the resistance of the air. This is illustrated diagrammatically in Figure 1, the ripples representing the sound wave, or series of waves, decreasing in height, or amplitude, to use the technical description. The actual waveform is represented by a section through the ripples taken along a particular direction, and is quite noticeable how this decreases in amplitude with distance. The amplitude represents the energy content of the wave, and at a distance from the source this becomes too small to be audible. The only way in which this limitation can be overcome i.e. to make the sound audible at a greater distance, is to increase its volume or make the amplitude greater to start with. This is the principle behind the loud hailer, or public address system, which amplifies or magnifies the original sound. But again, there are obvious limits to what can be done in this respect. The other thing about sound waves is that they are affected by wind. A following wind will increase the distance over which a given sound can be heard, and a headwind has the opposite effect. Another factor which can be significant is the presence of other sounds from other sources, which can mask the original sound in which we are interested. To transmit sound over long distances, some other method is obviously necessary. One method is to turn the sound waves into electrical waves, which can be transmitted along a length of wire. Figure 2. This is the principle of the telegraph, or telephone. There are several immediate advantages. The transmission is completely free from wind effects and from external sounds, provided these do not reach the microphone, although there may be some noise generated in the electrical circuit <coughs> itself. Also, to carry the sound over a great distance, it is only necessary to increase the length of the wire. There will be some loss of energy due to the electrical resistance of the circuit, but this can be overcome by inserting another unit to boost or amplify, <coughs> to boost or amplify the electrical waves, if necessary. An electrical, and electrical waves are easy to boost in this manner, whereas sound waves are not. The other alternative is to turn the sound waves into electrical energy, which is then transmitted through the air, rather than along a wire. These waves can be then picked up by a distant receiver, which then turns the electrical waves back into sound waves. We have all the advantages of the telephone system without wires, plus the fact that the range can be extended to thousands of miles without too much trouble. This is because electrical waves transmitted through air suffer very little loss of energy, and in fact do not need air at all to conduct them. They will travel just as well through empty space. Another important difference compared with sound waves is that electrical waves are much more closely spaced together, or have a higher frequency than sound waves. Sound waves range in frequency from about 30 cycles per second, a very low note, to about 16,000 cycles per second, which is a very high-pitched note and about the upper limit for audibility. Electrical waves within this frequency can be transmitted along a wire so that a telephone is a simple and uncomplicated converter of sound into electrical waves, and vice versa. But to be capable of radiation through the air, the electrical waves must be of much higher frequency. The latter type are known as radio waves, and may have frequencies ranging from about 150,000 cycles per second up to several hundred million cycles per second. See figure 3. Some frequencies are known as audio frequencies, and radio frequencies as radio frequencies, or RF.
Sound frequencies are known as audio frequencies and radio frequencies as radio frequencies, RF. It, allow, it also follows that radio waves are of much too high a frequency to be heard, the upper limit of frequency for audibility being only about 16 kilocycles per second. Okay, going back. A cycle means a complete wave up and down. The rate at which these waves vibrate or oscillate is known as the frequency expressed as so many cycles per second. In the case of radio waves, the frequency is normally specified in kilocycles per second, one kilocycle being equal to 1,000 cycles, or megacycles per second, one megacycle being equal to 1 million cycles. To conform to international standards, the term cycles per second, or C per S, as an abbreviation, is now replaced by the single word hertz, abbreviated as hertz. Kilocycles per second thus become kilohertz and megacycles per second megahertz. Radio transmission thus involves the complication of first turning sound frequencies, AF, into radio frequencies, RF, for transmission, and then re reconverting radio frequency signals, RF, into audio frequencies, AF, at the receiving end. The first is done by a radio transmitter, and the second by a radio receiver. There are also other complications, such as the necessity of transmitting various different sounds simultaneously, which we will come to a little later. One other important difference between radio waves and sound waves is that radio waves travel at a very high velocity, 186,000 miles per second, which for all practical purposes means that radio waves take no time at all to travel from one point on the Earth to another. A radio signal would only take about one and one-third seconds to reach... Well, I don't want to read that. Sound waves, on the other hand, travel relatively slowly, about one-fifth of a mile per second, or 720 miles per second. This is because they are pressure waves, whereas radio waves are electromagnetic waves. We can hear and feel pressure waves, i.e. sound, but not electromagnetic waves. We have mentioned the wide range of RF frequencies in use. These can be divided into various bands. Viz. Long wave is 150 to 500 kilohertz per second. Medium wave is 500 to 1500 kilohertz. And short wave is 1.5 to 30 megahertz. Or sorry, yeah, megacycles per second. VHF, very high frequencies above 30 megahertz or megacycles per second. The description long wave, medium wave, and short wave stem from the original method of designating a broadcast frequency by the wavelength of the signal. In fact, tuning dials on radio receivers are still more commonly marked in wavelength than frequency. We can convert from wavelength to frequency, or vice versa, by using the simple relationship. Wavelength times frequency equals velocity of the electromagnetic waves. However, wavelength is always given in meters, so we must also express velocity in similar units, i.e. 300 million meters per second. Thus, wavelength in meters times frequency, which is cycles per second, equals 300 million, or wavelength in meters equals or Wavelength in meters times frequency in kilohertz is 300,000, or wavelength in meters times frequency is 300 megahertz. The corresponding wavelengths for the various bands mentioned above are thus. Long wave equals 2,000 to 600 meters, medium wave 600 to 200 meters, and short wave 200 to 10 meters. Less and VHS, VHF is less than 10 meters. 
Note, if talking in terms of wavelength only, these figures would normally be quoted the other way around, as the band range. Example, long wave 600 to 2000 meters. Each radio transmitting station has its own particular RF frequency or equivalent wavelength allocated by international agreement. Any one station always operates on this frequency, although it may also put out the same program on other frequencies in different bands. A radio receiver is made tunable over a long range of frequencies so that it can be adjusted to pick up the transmissions of a number of different transmitting stations. Due to technical difficulties, it is virtually impossible to make a receiver tunable over the whole range of RF frequencies from 150 kilohertz to over 30 megahertz, and so separate tuning stages are provided for each band. Some receivers may have only two tuning bands, long wave and medium wave. Others may also include a short wave band and possibly a VHF band. More specialized receiver designs may cover only the short wave and or VHF bands and split these bands into still further sub bands for ease of tuning. The same principle applies throughout, however. A radio receiver is made tunable to a range of RF frequencies or equivalent wavelengths. This in itself is quite a simple process, involving only a minimum of components. The snag lies in the fact that the RF signal picked up by the receiver is completely inaudible. It is well above the range of audible frequencies. It is necessary to modify the RF signal in some manner so that it can transmit speech and music, i.e. audio frequencies, capable of being decoded and put out as AF by the receiver via an earphone or loudspeaker. The manner in which this is done is as follows. The RF signal transmitted by the radio station is of fixed frequency, equivalent to a single note, but of far too high a pitch to be heard. The AF content of the program to be transmitted is superimposed on the fixed frequency signal, causing it in effect to warble at audio frequency. Technically, this is called modulation. The fixed frequency RF signal is called the carrier, so that when the AF content is superimposed, the actual signal put out is modulated RF. Figure 4 shows, the diagrammatically, shows this diagrammatically. With the transmitting station switched on, but not actually broadcasting, just the carrier signal is being put out. Once the station starts to transmit speech or music, the signal turns into modulated RF. The RF frequency remains unaltered, <coughs> so a receiver adjusted to the same frequency will remain tuned in. But additional components in the receiver can now demodulate or detect the RF component of the signal, extract it from the carrier, and feed it to the headphone or a loudspeaker to transform it back into audible sound. This is really all we need to know about the process. All the necessary modulation is done by the transmitting station. The receiver merely has to be made tunable to the carrier frequency and given the ability to extract the AF component of the modulated sig signal. <coughs> we might, however, have a look at the two different methods of modulation employed, as these will affect the design of the receiver. The type of modulation shown in Figure 4, where the carrier wave, where the carrier remains at the same frequency, but its amplitude is varied by modulation, is known as amplitude modulation. This is used on the long, medium, and short wave bands. In fact, the form of the modulated Wave shown represents modulation by a single AF note. In practice, many different AF notes will be involved in superimposing speech and music on the carrier, so that the actual shape will be very much more complex and continuously varying. Example, see Figure 5. <coughs> 
<coughs> this does not affect the issue at all, as demodulation by the receiver remains basically straightforward. The other type of modulation is known as frequency modulation, FM. This has a number of technical advantages over AM, but also necessitates the use of a much higher carrier frequency. FM is thus restricted to the v <coughs> VHF bands, usually from about 50 MHz upwards. It also involves the use of a different type of receiver design, which is considerably more complicated and generally outside the scope of straightforward amateur construction, as most VHF receivers are. For the sake of completeness, however, we will describe the system, a typical FM signal being shown in figure, figure 6. It will be seen that the amplitude of the transmitted signal remains the same, but the frequency varies in manner, which exactly follows the superimposed speech, or music, AF content. This is seen as a compression and expansion of the carrier. It is obvious that a different type of receiver is required both to stay in tune with the station as its frequency varies and to extract the AF component of the signal. We can now set down the basic principles involved in the design of a simple radio receiver. First we need a means of picking up the transmitter signal. The simplest way of doing this is to use a piece of wire known as an aerial. If this is cut to the same length, or a multiple or a fraction of the signal wavelength, it will receive the signal at maximum possible strength. Such a fixed length of wire should, however, be tuned to a particular broadcast frequency only, although it would pick up signals of other frequencies more weakly. With frequency modulation, FM, the RF wave has constant amplitude, but frequency is varied as shown by the compression and expansion of the wave pattern. To make the aerial tunable, we need to add a simple circuit to it, comprising basically a resistor and a capacitor, the value of one or both of which is variable. This will make the response of resonant frequency of the aerial circuit combination variable in order to tune it to get maximum signal strength over a range of frequencies. <coughs> this addition of this tunable circuit, or tuned circuit, as it is usually called, also makes the aerial length far less critical. It can be much shorter, wound in the form of a coil for convenience and become a part of the tuned circuit itself, i.e. the resistor component. An external aerial wire then no longer becomes necessary. Most modern domestic radios utilize this configuration. However, satisfactory performance in such cases depends on the tuned circuit, or more specifically, the coil component in the tuned circuit, being very efficient. With less efficient coils, the and particularly in areas of low signal strength, the addition of an external aerial to a tuned circuit will improve reception. More on this when we come to making up tuned circuits for simple receivers. Having tuned in to the frequency required and providing adjustment to tune it different to tune into different frequencies, I'll start that again. Having tuned into the frequency required and provided adjustment to tune into different frequencies to pick up different stations, we have captured the modulated RF signal in the tuned circuit. All we then need is a detector to extract the AF component. When this can be fed directly to earphones to make the incoming signal audible. See figure 7. Block diagram of the simplest layout for a radio receiver. Such a very basic receiver does nonetheless have serious limitations, mainly because the actual signal level received is very low, and the detector merely extracts from this 
and does not boost it in any way. The amount of AF volume realizable is dependent entirely on the strength of the incoming signal and the efficiency of the tune circuit in responding to that signal. The AF output power will only be capable of driving a small deaf aid type earpiece, and then the volume will be quite weak. Only local broadcast stations or very powerful stations are likely to be picked up at a hearing level. Having got the signal into the receiver, however, and extracted the AF component, we can boost or amplify it by introducing an additional circuit into the receiver. This is known simply as an amplifier, and we can add one or more stages of amplification as necessary in order to boost the AF signal to a level sufficient to power a loudspeaker and make for comfortable listening. Theoretically, we could go on boosting the AF signal to any required level in this way, but there are snags. Besides boosting the AF signal, amplification will also boost any unwanted signals which may also be present in the extracted RF, and each stage of amplification will introduce some distortion in the AF signal. We could end up with a very loud but badly distorted or even unintelligible RF output from the loudspeaker. There are thus limits to the practical amplification which can be provided, especially with transistor circuits, but there are also other little tricks or receiver designs which we can use to improve both the output and quality of the reception. These will be discussed in the descriptions of the various receiver designs which follow in later chapters.